This is so exciting. It's been a while since we've been together. Welcome back to Skeptical Inquirer Presents. This is a series of live online presentations from experts who are devoted to advancing science over pseudoscience, media literacy over conspiracy theories, and critical thinking over magical thinking. My name is Leanne Lord, and I am delighted to return as your host. I am a stand-up comedian, author, Center for Inquiry fellow, and fellow Earth dweller, at least until the Vogons get here. I'm still in the glow of Valentine's Day, and I think this is a great way to kick off our new season with our collective love of knowledge. Now, as we get settled in, uh, I have a couple of quick reminders. The CFI, CFI's podcast, Point of Inquiry, is indeed available wherever you get your podcasts. If you would like to upgrade your beach reading or spruce up your coffee table, might I suggest a subscription to Skeptical Inquirer magazine, which is, of course, available at, skeptical, at skepticalinquirer.org. Now, if you have any questions for our guest, please type them into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. Now, tonight's presentation, Medical Myths and Superstitions, How Our Instincts Can Lead Us Astray. Um, mm -hmm. Our guest, Erica Engelhoft, is the author of Gory Details, which uncovers fascinating stories about medical treatments involving all manner of bodily fluids, you, while exploring the concepts of disgust and magical thinking. She'll also talk about more extreme examples of delusions of infestation in which people with no other sign of mental illness become convinced that insects have taken over their bodies. Full disclosure, not only am I squeamish about this topic, which is on brand for privileged Western culture, uh, but I'm also, and I cannot stress this enough, extremely bug phobic. Okay, where there's a bug of any kind, I turn into one of the Daleks from Doctor Who. Exterminate, exterminate. <laughs> <laughs> this is a joke only some of you will get, but it's worth saying. But seriously, I, I broke a toe running away from a spider. I've changed hotel rooms to avoid a confrontation with a water bug. I've never seen the movies Starship Troopers, Arachnophobia, or Eight-Legged Freaks. Yes, I've, I've got it bad and that ain't good. So I am glad that there are people in the world like Erica who clearly have way more intestinal fortitude than I do. Erica is a freelance science writer and editor. Uh, she was the online science editor at National Geographic. Uh, her writing has appeared in newspapers, magazines, and websites, including the Philadelphia Inquirer and NPR, two of my faves. Uh, she also loves storytelling and has appeared on stage and in podcasts, such as The Story Collider. She is a former deputy managing editor at the Science News Magazine and senior associate Associate Editor covering climate change at environmental science and technology. Very impressive. On a more serious note, I love that we both have big cats. Um, mine is 20 pounds and I'm not saying it's a contest, but my boy wins. <laughs> 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 but here with us to talk about medical myths and superstitions, how our instincts can lead us astray. Please welcome to Skeptical Inquirer Presents, the author of Gory Details, Erica Engelhop. Erica, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. This so is going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me. And I always love the chance to talk to an audience of people who are squeamish and afraid of bugs. <laughs> because boy, am I going to make you uncomfortable, but hopefully we're going to have some laughs and fun along the way. Um, this is the book that we'll be talking about, Gory Details. Um, FYI, it, the cover glows in the dark. So uh, Leanne, if you have not tried that yet with your copy, highly recommended to uh, take it into a dark bathroom at night. So with that said, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I've got um, just a little PowerPoint that will give us a few things to look at while I'm talking and talking. Let's see here. There we go. So 
Again, our topic tonight, medical myths and superstitions, how our instincts can lead us astray. And as you might be able to guess from the kinds of things that are on the cover of my book, uh, the instincts that I tend to refer to um, tend to be things like disgust. So for example, this is just a glimpse at my bookshelf to give you an idea of some of the kinds of things that I'm interested in and the research I was doing as I wrote my book. Um, you'll notice titles like King of Poisons, uh, Death's Acre, uh, Slime. This is right up, this is the kind of stuff that's right up my alley. And of course, I've got a whole section on bugs over here with uh, infested, the infested mind. Oh, and animal cannibalism, I can't forget that. So, um, so the book has a lot of uh, a lot of gory details about a variety of topics, including uh, some of the medical myths and superstitions we'll talk about tonight. So these are just a few of the themes that um, are found in my book and that I'm particularly interested in. Uh, one is morbid curiosity, um, our fascination with death, obviously. Uh, disgust, which is what we're going to be focusing on tonight. That's an emotional reaction to something that's gross that we consider gross. Um, and then taboos, acts or ideas that are forbidden. Uh, and then some of the other, some of the other uh, chapters that appear in my book. Uh, Leanne's favorite is, is a chapter on creepy crawlies where I've got all of the stuff about my uh, you know, obsession with insects and, um, and our interactions with them. We know what makes something creepy crawly to us. Um, and then Gross Anatomy, which is a particular chapter that I'm going to be pulling several, um, several stories from this evening. Um, and that kind of crosses over some with the Mysterious Minds, which is a chapter that I have about some of our strange psychology. And um, of course, that gets into our relationship to Gross Anatomy and things that are disgusting to us. So again, um, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to uh, the illustrator uh, for gory details, um, Brianne Morrow Cribs. She did a wonderful job illustrating these. And just again, we're going to be talking mainly about things that are in the chapter um, in the book on what I'm calling gross anatomy. So to start off with, um, let's talk about disgust and magical thinking, because as Leanne said in the introduction, um, I'm going to kind of try to talk tonight about where some of these medical myths come from um, and why we're, we're all not just, you know, the squeamish, <laughs> but why, why we're all um, somewhat vulnerable to some of these um, misconceptions that we may have. Okay, so what is disgust? Disgust technically is a feeling, it's an emotion. It's a feeling of aversion towards something. Um, Researchers who've studied disgust, like Valerie Curtis, um, have said that disgust is an evolved psychological system for protecting organisms from infection through disease avoidant behavior. Okay, so when something's disgusting, you avoid it, right? So things like open wounds or someone's someone else's blood or vomit, those are things that are fairly universally considered to be disgusting. We avoid them. And the idea is that perhaps this evolved um, as a way of protecting ourselves. And that makes a lot of sense for things that are um, possibly infectious or could hurt us. Okay. Um, disgust has become a very powerful emotion for many of us. And, um, you know, Darwin counted it as one of the six basic emotions. Um, but I will give a caveat there. Um, even though many scientists think that disgust may be something that has evolved in humans um, and that we've elaborated on greatly, it also has a strong cultural element and we can learn to be disgusted by something. You know, many people have pointed out, yeah, everyone pretty much universally as an adult is disgusted by poop but babies will play with poop and have no problem with poop and will sometimes stick it in their mouth. And, you know, it's something that, that we learn to be disgusted by at a young age. Um, also, when you look at food and our cultures around food, 
something that's considered completely disgusting in one culture could be a delicacy, could be a really yummy food for an, for other people. So it's not that you know, things can really be defined as this is disgusting, this is not disgusting. There is going to be a cultural element to what we think is disgusting, what any individual thinks is disgusting. So, <laughs> you know, it, it, there is kind of this universal um, emotion though, even if what we find disgusting varies from culture to culture, uh, there is this kind of, we all have this universal um, emotion in our, um, you know, within our emotional range. So it's probably pretty easy for you to tell which of these pictures show someone who's disgusted versus someone who's afraid, right? Um, you're all going to pick A. A is the person who's disgusted, B is the person who's afraid. Um, there's a particular facial expression associated with disgust. It's the squinched nose, um, the, the loose kind of open lips, sometimes even like pushing your tongue out. So those are kind of closing off the, you know, closing off way, ways of entry <laughs> that something disgusting could get in. That might be why we, we make that particular face. Um, there are also particular neurological signs that we all feel, you know, in terms of, um, our blood pressure, feeling nausea, that type of thing. Um, and characteristic actions like, you know, throwing something down, um, shuddering, those are all uh, things that researchers who study discuss, like Paul Rosen, who all of whose work I'll just discuss quite a bit because he has he's a very prominent researcher studying disgust. Um, you know, th those are all things that researchers have observed. Now, what do I mean by magical thinking? Um, that's something that I think you've talked about before in the Skeptical Inquirer series. So magical thinking is basically just a set of beliefs saying that two unrelated events or phenomena are connected and affect each other. Um, so, you know, you don't have to believe literally in magic like Harry Potter style in order to be subject to magical thinking. You know, just basically believing seeing a coincidence and thinking that it's cause and effect, that's magical thinking. Um, a subset of this kind of magical thinking are what has been called the laws of sympathetic magic. And this is gonna relate more to disgust. Okay, so the law of similarity um, is where our magical thinking has us believe or imagine that the image is equal to the object. Okay, this is the same kind of thinking that makes um, burning someone in effigy, um, more a, a very powerful symbol, make even more than a symbol because, or, you know, poking a voodoo doll because the voodoo doll is representing the person. And so by poking the voodoo doll, it's like I'm poking the person. Okay. And then the law of contagion, this is very important to discuss. The idea of contagion is that once something is in contact, it's always in contact. Um, why is this magical thinking? Well, imagine that um, I told you that Hitler had touched this pen. Do you want this pen? Do you wanna hold this pen? Well, you probably don't because the idea is that essentially there's some kind of essence that's been transferred. And if it's a negative connotation, then that's going to sort of infect um, any object that comes in contact with that. Um, so we have a lot of feelings about, <laughs> about um, items that um, come into this kind of idea of contagion. All right. So some examples specifically of how magical thinking and disgust can interact. Okay, so for the law of similarity, and again, this is gonna be citing a lot of research by um, Paul Rosen, uh, University of Pennsylvania. So, as he's noted, you know, in the law of similarity. Okay, so here's one example. People are reluctant to eat sugar labeled as toxic, even if they know that that label is false. Like for example, they did an experiment where they had people put a label arbitrarily on something and then ask them if they wanted to eat it. <laughs> um, even if the label says non-toxic, once you've had that idea of toxic, then 
you know, then there's basically sort of a contagion there. So just the idea that something even says it's poison, um, even when you know for sure that it's not, it still kind of makes you feel like something's off with that item. Um, a very obvious one, how many people really want to eat chocolate or fudge if it's shaped like dog poop? Not very many, even I don't, you know. <laughs> I like to think that I'm pretty hard to gross out, but um, even knowing 100% that it's not poop, I don't want it to be shaped like poop, okay? Um, so that's law of similarity in action. Law of contagion, a good example for that is an experiment that Rosin did where um, they would have people choosing between two different kinds of juice, which one would you prefer? Um, and if they saw that one of the types of juice was touched with a dead sterilized roach, okay, the roach is not going to hurt you, but it did touch that juice, okay? Um, now, obviously, people are not going to want to touch the juice that had the roach in it, right? But even with the law of contagion, even the idea of the same type of juice then becomes contaminated. So if I had apple juice and grape juice um, and I put a roach in apple juice and then I poured you a nice fresh cup of apple juice or a fresh cup of grape juice that did not touch the roach, people are still much more likely to be averse to that type of juice that they had seen touch a roach. So that's the idea of contagion. It's even though you know that something didn't touch, it's not con actually contaminated, it's been contaminated in your mind. And that's the type of magical thinking that we're talking about. So I'm gonna start going through some of our favorite things, body fluids, because I've noticed in the course of the research for my book, um, all of these ideas that Rosin and, dis and other discussed researchers um, you know, have been talking about with magical thinking, I see it play out when I talk to people about real life health and wellness and medical issues. So the first one I wanna talk about is sweat. Um, I wrote an article a few years back called Factor Fiction, Can You Really Sweat Out Toxins? Um, I got pretty, uh, pretty strong reaction to this from some people, I was a little surprised. So, People have a lot of feelings about, about all of these body fluids, but when it comes to sweat, it's something that we consider gross, disgusting. We don't, you know, we don't want to sweat, but maybe partly because we consider it gross, we like to imagine that lots of toxins are coming out of us in our sweat. And it's become a pretty popular thing for people to pay quite a bit of money to sit in something like an infrared sauna, like this photo of a woman in an, in an IR sauna in New York City. Um, nothing wrong, I don't have anything against saunas um, and you know they may have some benefits um, health-wise, but um, the idea that's being touted in many cases is that these saunas are special in some way of make, helping you draw out toxins from your body through your sweat. Um, unfortunately, that is not really the case. But why do we think that? Why are we? Why, why do we love to believe that? Um, so I spoke to a researcher, and I'm going to go ahead and just read you a little bit um, out of the book. Okay, so this is on the idea of detox and toxins in general, okay? So for one thing, most detox products and diet plans are pretty vague about what toxins exactly we need to rid ourselves of. Pesticides, metals, whatever makes up processed cheese, whatever they are, toxins sound nasty and we want them out. And because we can't see them, it's pretty easy to con convince people that fasting or drinking something green or sweating a lot will do it. After all, if it's unpleasant, it must be good for you, right? But when you consider how toxic substances actually accumulate inside us and the body's means of getting rid of them, you'll realize that most detox plans make about as much sense for your health as a tapeworm diet. So the researcher that I spoke to started looking at what is actually in sweat 
and what are these, what kind of toxins um, might people imagine that they're sweating out, okay? So dissolved in sweat, I'm talking about um, sweat produced by our equine glands, which is what um, covers most of our body. That's most of our sweat. That's when we exercise. That's the type of sweat we have. Okay. Um, it's mostly water, more than 99% water, but you've also got a little bit of um, minerals, sodium, calcium. You've got a little bit of proteins, lactic acid, and urea. Ah, urea, you're thinking. So, you know, good. I can sweat out something gross and bad for me, urea. Well, unfortunately, sweat is a very, very minor way of getting rid of urea from your body. Urea is known for getting into your urine, urine <laughs> and that's the main way that we excrete it. So your kidneys are responsible for helping you, um, you know, filter, filter that out. And basically that's going to pass much, you know, 99 point something percent. Um, through your urine. But what about other stuff? So researcher Pascal and both organic pollutants, these are the kind of things that we tend to be afraid of when we say like, oh, toxic substances in our environment, things like pesticides and flame retardants, things that we don't want in our food um, and that we might want to rid ourselves of. So he looked at how much of these um, chemicals could be detected in human sweat. He did a calculation based on this, finding that a typical person who does 45 minutes of high intensity exercise, sweating a lot, could sweat a total of two liters of sweat in a day, which is, that's a lot of sweat, right? Um, but all of that sweat together would contain less than one tenth of one nanogram of these persistent organic pollutants. So putting that in perspective, the amount in your sweat is 0.02% of what you ingest every day on a typical diet. So in other words, there's literally no way that you could sweat enough to get rid of 1% of the tiny amount of persistent organic pollutants that you are likely to eat in your food that day. Um, so it's a terrible way of getting rid of these pollutants. Um, and yet people really, I think because of, of our um, feeling of disgust and our intuitive sense that if, it, if it's gross, then it must contain something bad. And then we transfer this idea of toxins to it. And it's very appealing to think that we can turn this kind of gross body fluid into something that's purifying us, that's getting rid of all of these toxins. Um, that can be kind of dangerous uh, for one thing. Um, there have been people who have gone too far with these kind of sweat therapies. Uh, there was a woman who unfortunately died in a sweat lodge um, uh, in a detoxification treatment. Um, where they plastered her with mud, put her in plastic, wrapped her in plastic and so forth. And after hours of that, she died of, you know, extreme overheating in an effort to rid herself of these toxins. Um, you know, it, you also see this kind of idea crop up some with um, the Church of Scientology, um, where there is an emphasis also on um, spending a lot of time in saunas and sweating and again, as, as a, a way of purifying the body. Um, after 9-11, there was even a, um, a, a Church of Scientology sponsored center for uh, workers who had been exposed to pollutants in 9-11 to go and do these kind of therapies to supposedly rid themselves of these chemicals. Um, now, nothing wrong with sweating. I'm all for exercise, um, but the idea that you're going to uh, rely on something like this to maintain your health um, is kind of a, is a dangerous idea. So um, I'm just gonna put that out there and say, when I wrote this story, I had some backlash and 
I did have one person um, on Twitter suggest that I should have toxins poured down my throat for um, disparaging, you know, this idea of um, of sweating out toxins because it's so clear that it's good for you. So <laughs> that's what I'm going to say about sweat for now. Um, let's move on and talk a little bit about blood. So bloodletting still happening. Um, you may think of it as a very oldie timey thing. Um, there's a medieval picture, you know, uh, image of, of bloodletting up here, but it actually is something that still um, happens to some extent in different parts of the world. A lot of people still believe in this idea again of um, that it, you know, if the if there's something bad in the blood, then you've got to get rid of the blood. Okay, um, it's an appealing idea to humans for <laughs> for whatever reason. Um, so this video, this is a still from a, a video of um, a mosque in India where um, near the mosque, there's a bloodletting practitioner who's set up. Um, let's see, I'm going to read you just a little section of the book about this. So in the shadow of one of India's largest mosques, the gutters run red with blood. The method is precise. First professional bloodletters wrap patients' arms and legs with straps as tourniquets to control the blood flow. Next, they use razor blades to make tiny pricks in the hands and feet. Blood trickles into a concrete trough stained red with the day's work. Meanwhile, the bleeding people look pretty happy. They've come to be cured of everything from arthritis to cancer and pay for the service. Why hasn't the bloodletting business, which doctors today would classify as quackery, dried up? Simple, it's been marketed as a miracle health panacea. Um, so the history of bloodletting goes back at least 3000 years to the Egyptians. Uh, the Greek physician Galen developed his own rationale for the practice in the second century. His idea, which is not correct, is that the liver was responsible for making blood and sometimes produced too much blood and that you had to let it off in order to put the body back in equilibrium. Um, that idea of equilibrium has um, you know, come up again and again through the years and the idea of contamination, okay? The idea that there's something bad in the blood so you need to get the blood out. Um, it's, you know, it, it's, it's still going on today, but it really kind of, it hit its, its peak probably in the middle ages, but then continued on right through the early days of this country. An interesting story that I like to tell about bloodletting is that um, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence was a doctor named Benjamin Rush. He was very prominent in his day. And during the 1793 yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia, he started draining people's blood right and left in an effort to combat yellow fever, okay? Um, and by all accounts, he was such a bloodletting fanatic um, that during the yellow fever outbreak, uh, his biographer recounts that so much blood was spilled in his front yard that the site became malodorous and buzzed with flies. A later estimate suggested that nearly half of Russia's patients died. It was during this time he was actually uh, embroiled in a legal case concerning his bloodletting practice when he um, got word that President George Washington was dying at Mount Vernon. Uh, George Washington had recently retired. He was suffering from a severe throat infection and he was bled to the point that they estimated five pints of blood were taken from him, nearly half his body's supply, and he died that night. So blood blooding may actually be to blame for the death of America's first president. And yet there are still people who really wanna believe that blood blooding is a viable cure for all sorts of things. Um, if you look at this video on YouTube that National Geographic produced, you know, there were a number of people who commented that, um, you know, bloodletting is perfectly valid um, and compared it even to the, the modern day medical use of leeches. 
which in my opinion is a completely different thing. Um, <laughs> you know, leeches are not being used today in order to draw off large volumes of blood. They're used sometimes in microsurgery to um, prevent clotting in small blood vessels, but that is not the same thing at all um, as the idea of drawing off large volumes of blood, which can actually be quite dangerous. But when something is gross, when a body fluid is gross, we have seem to have no problem trying to get rid of it, <laughs> just as we did the sweat. Our, our relationship with urine though, I have found very interesting. It seems like we have a kind of a complicated relationship to urine, especially when we look at our own urine versus someone else's. There have been um, ideas through the years that uh, even that going so far as to say that drinking one's own urine is, um, um, has medical benefits. Um, in 1978, the prime minister of India um, told reporter Dan Rather on 60 Minutes that he drank his own urine every day and that drinking urine fights the cause of all diseases. Um, <laughs> now, I don't think a lot of Americans necessarily took up that practice at the time, but there are people and you can if you are so inclined, go to YouTube and see for yourself. There are people um, even now who are proponents of the idea of drinking their own urine. Um, for the record, not good for you. <laughs> That's waste products uh, that you don't want. Um, also, there are so many myths about urine. Um, a common one is has to do with peeing on wounds. For some reason, people are obsessed with the idea of peeing on jellyfish stings. I've seen so many references to this. Um, when I looked into it, it turns out that, no, you do not want your friend to pee on your jellyfish sting. That will actually um, lower the pH and make the nematocyst, the stinging cells of the jellyfish release more. So if, if anything, it's going to make it worse. <laughs> Um, instead, you know, if you need, if you have a jellyfish sting, just rinse with clean water. Um, but no, we, you know, for some reason, we like to believe that these body fluids either have some sort of um, cure in them, or in other cases that, you know, they're carrying toxins away. A lot of our ideas don't seem to make a lot of logical sense when you put them together. Um, for example, we're horrified at the idea of peeing in the pool. That's another thing I've written about is how much pee is actually in the average pool. Well, it's quite a bit. Um, and yes, it can react with chlorine and produce some toxic gases. Um, so not great. I don't want pee in the pool. Um, but is it a really big problem? Probably not. It's probably not going to make you sick. Um, on the other hand, do I think that people should be drinking their own urine? No, do not do that. And if you are, for some reason, finding yourself stranded on a desert island or without water, uh, no, you can't drink your own urine and survive on that. Um, it, it's basically like drinking seawater. Um, it will not hydrate you. Um, and that's not a good idea. Um, People seem to have this idea that peeing on a wound, however, is a good idea. And um, that comes from the idea, and I've heard this repeated a lot, people believe that urine is sterile. Um, now, I don't know why people would be horrified to touch someone else's pee on a public toilet seat, but yet, if it's our own urine, we seem perfectly fine with the idea of drinking it or peeing on our own wounds <laughs> or, or having a loved one who's, because we love that person, um, then they're not gross. And so then they're allowed to pee on our wounds. Okay, it, urine is not sterile. Nothing about our bodies is sterile. There's a normal flora of bacteria that lives in our bladders um, and Yes, you don't want too many. You can have bladder infection with too many bacteria or the wrong kinds of bacteria, but 
It does not therefore follow that the normal state of urine is to be sterile um, or for our bladders to contain no bacteria. That is not the case. So <clears throat> kind of similarly to how I said, we have different feelings about the disgustingness of urine, whether it comes from us versus someone else and whether that other person is unrelated or, you know, if it's a friend or someone we love, it's less gross um, than if it's from a stranger. Okay. That's kind of, that kind of relates back to that idea of magical thinking, you know, we, the, the, the similarity and, and the objects transferring qualities from one thing to another. So if, um, you know, if body, bodily fluid comes out of a good person that we like, it's one thing. If it comes out of, if, you know, if it was, if it was Hitler's pee, I can't even imagine it'd be the worst thing in the world. Right. Um, but even a stranger's bodily fluids are considered more disgusting than those of um, our own family members and certainly more so than our own. Uh, the same kind of thing holds true for saliva. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but I don't love when people's dogs try to lick my face. I find that kind of gross. Um, and I've had people say to me, oh, don't worry about it. His mouth is cleaner than yours. A, you know, dog's mouths are very, very clean. Um, no, dog's mouths are just full of bacteria, just like ours are. <laughs> um, and, you know, when you're talking about different species, uh, the, we have different bacteria and no, you don't want dog bacteria in your mouth. Um, same thing with cats. Okay. Um, but there's a whole mythology around, um, allowing dogs to lick wounds and the idea that their mouths are clean or have contained some kind of healing properties. Probably this came from observing the fact that a lot of animals will lick their own wounds. And again, you know, for yourself, you have your own microflora. So if you were to lick your own wound, um, the chances of giving yourself a terrible infection, life-threatening infection, probably aren't real high. Um, likewise, if a, you know, mother dog licks her puppy's wound or something like that, you know, um, probably not real high chance that she's going to give them a fatal infection. However, um, when you're talking about cross species, now it's a different situation. But for some reason, we have a hard time accepting this. And I think it particularly comes down to um, the fact that we love our dogs and cats so much. So we have a lot of ideas like um, there are stories about how in ancient Egypt, uh, the city of Sinopolis, city of dogs, had a lot of temples to Anubis, who was a dog-headed god, and um, that there was, uh, there are tales that there were dogs employed there to lick people's wounds because it was they were considered to be healing. Um, same thing happened with uh, Greek ancient Greek temples to Asclepius, the god of medicine. The idea was that that dogs were kept there and used to lick people's wounds. There's even um, a saying that I've, I've seen, uh, long de chien, long de médecin, uh, in French, meaning the tongue of the dog is, is the, the tongue of um, medicine, is a doctor's tongue. So all of that is not correct. Just because we love our dogs um, does not mean that it is a good idea to have them licking us. Um, <laughs> they, um, they actually carry a lot of pathogens that can be very dangerous to people. In fact, I wrote about some kind of really sad and terrible stories where people whose pets had licked their wounds ended up losing limbs. Um, you can even die. Uh, one of the bacteria that's found in some cat's mouths, um, uh, an infection with that bacteria can be, is fatal to, I think it was 26% of people who are infected um, with that through a wound. So that's not good odds. I don't like that. I don't want that. And so, um, yes, I will let my cat lick my hand occasionally. 
um, but I will then wash my hand. And I would never let a cat or a dog lick an open wound. Um, you don't want that getting inside your body. Uh, so let's talk about feces. <laughs> right before, oh, sorry, gotta go back. Right before I get to talking about the, the creepy crawlies. Um, this is actually a case where our sense of disgust kind of holds us back from something that may have real health benefits. So you may have heard by now fecal transplants um, commonly used, well, sort of commonly used uh, for treating infections of C. difficile, which can be a life-threatening infection for some people. Um, also for people with uh, irritable bowel disease and variety of other things, it's being looked at as a way to transfer good or healthy uh, microbes from one person to another um, by actually using stool samples. Um, interesting aside, going back to the, the pets, because it was difficult to get fecal transplants, there have been reported cases of some people trying to use their dog's poop to make a sample to do a, a home-grown brew uh, for a fecal transplant. Also, don't do that. Um, <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't want dog poop bacteria in your body. Um, that, that's not a good idea. Just because they're your pet doesn't mean that they're clean and healthy <laughs> and that their feces is good for you. It's not. Okay. Um, and with the little bit of time I've got left, I wanted to talk about um, a story that's ended up being very close to my heart, which is about delusions of infestation. Uh, you know, Leanne said in the beginning that she's very uh, squeamish, very scared of, of insects. That is super common. Um, and the way that it relates, I think, sometimes to magical thinking and can actually harm, really harm our health is that there's a condition called delusions of infestation, sometimes called Ekbom syndrome or delusions of parasitosis. Um, this is a condition that is not as uncommon as you might think, where people become absolutely convinced that their bodies are infested with um, usually insects. Um, why insects? I think it goes back to that very kind of basic fear and disgust that a lot of us feel. And, you know, here I'm talking about Westerners. We, we didn't grow up um, eating any insects. We grew up, you know, really loathing them and learning from an early age that they're gross and disgusting and scary. And because of that, it kind of makes sense that you've got people who, let's say they have one of the many, many different kinds of conditions that can cause um, an itching or crawling sensation on the skin, which is actually called formication. Formication is a word derived from ants, the same, from the same root word as ants. So um, that feeling like ants are crawling on you, that's formication. A lot of different conditions, um, both skin conditions, neurological conditions, all kinds of things, even changes in your medication can cause a feeling of formication. But because we're so freaked out by the idea of insects on us, when something feels like insects on us, we might actually become convinced that it is insects on us. Um, this is a photo of me sitting at a microscope uh, at the University of Georgia, where I visited researchers who are entomologists who encounter people frequently who have delusions of infestation and are coming to them begging to have the insects diagnosed so that they can stop them. Um, and this puts entomologists in a really difficult position because if they don't find any insects on the person, and which by the way, there are, um, you know, head lice um, or well, body lice um, are something that can be a parasite on humans. And then there are um, scabies that can be in our skin. Both of those are fairly easy to diagnose um, as 
as real um, parasites or infestations that are on people. If a person doesn't have those, um, then the entomologist is in a difficult position of telling them that the insects are not there. And it can become pretty quickly something that people are so convinced of that, that you'll see this delusion set in even in people who have no other history of mental illness. Um, and I've, I've really seen some very sad cases, even doctors and nurses, people who are, um, who you would not imagine to uh, be delusional, but this is a very, this is discussed as a very powerful emotion, keep that in mind. And it can really drive our behavior and, um, you know, re really be a driving force in what we believe about our health. So with that, I'm going to make a pitch for why we should um, embrace the gross. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't feel disgust. I think it's perfectly natural and normal to feel disgust um, about a lot of things. Um, but I think it's also a good idea for us to be in control of our disgust, to realize what we're being disgusted by and why, and um, to not let it control our emotions or stop us from making rational decisions about our health. Okay, so reasons to do this, one, to be happier, um, being comfortable with curiosity, talking more openly, not being freaked out all the time <laughs> by our own body fluids, imagine that. Uh, being healthier, accepting our bodies, and rejecting the myths that play into disgust. All of these things that we've been talking about today, um, that, you know, ideas that people have about things that are good for them or bad for them, um, that are not based on science, but that are really based on, um, in large part, on the way we feel about our bodies, um, more, you know, gross secretions and excretions. Um, I also think it can help make us a little bit kinder. So recognizing when disgust is being manipulated uh, or weaponized against others, it's common for people to um, make their enemy, use terms of disgust when describing an enemy or someone who's other. Um, so recognizing that, seeing it, knowing when disgust is being used against someone and calling that out, I think is also a way that we can be more empathetic and kind. So with that, Leanne, I'm perfectly happy to start taking some questions. Fantastic. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Erica, for that. Um, I, I will say I didn't cringe as much as I thought I would. <laughs> Uh, I, I feel this has been um, informational and, and educational. Um, I just assume that when people were drinking their urine, they might have been trying to get their money's worth from bottled water. Um, <laughs> it's the ultimate I, recycling. You can't, I can't yes, argue with that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I, I, you know, a lot of this, these, these, these things that we do are educational for me as well. And I feel very seen when you talked about the law of similarity and the law of contagion. It's like, yeah, I've, I've fallen for that very, Absolutely. very easily. Absolutely. I mean, our brains work alike. And so none of us should think that we're above it all. <laughs> that's, really, <laughs> that's, that's one of the, one of the things that I've learned about myself. I'm not above it all either. <laughs> Okay. Well, dear diary, I am not above it all. That will be what I think about tonight with a cup of tea. And it, it, if I'm making this comparison accurately, please correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like, you know, bodily fluids are like politics in a way. If you like the person, it's fine. If you don't, <laughs> then it's, you know, it's all out war. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I think there's a lot to be said for that. And I mean, I think that's, that kind of gets it. Some of my ideas about, you know, being kinder to each other too, because I think we do, we weaponize disgust against each other. It's, it's pretty sad to say. 
you know what, that was like the, one of the first comments, um, Neil Solomon, if I'm seeing this correctly, asked, can disgust be manipulated for political purposes? Um, Absolutely. I, I think it, it is. And, you know, when you start thinking about it, you will start noticing it. Um, you know, Fidel mm-hmm. Castro was known for calling uh, his enemies worms. Um, mm-hmm. And, but, you know, but you'll start seeing it when Okay, you know, you have politicians who refer to other people being from shithole countries, if I can say that in this webinar, Um, you know, people using those kinds of terminology against each other. um, Think about that. Think about why you would why you would use certain words to describe um, people from another place. Yeah. We, yeah. It's dehumanizing, it's ad hominem attacks, which no one here in this audience would ever do. <laughs> right, guys? <laughs> Absolutely um, not. But you, you said that uh, you did the, that uh, you wrote an article about sweat and um, were maybe surprised about how many people had opinions um, about yes. that. I'm seeing this in the questions here. I did not know that, you know, people would die on the hill of urine. <laughs> 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 there are quite a few people. Uh, someone, David Wolf, said that um, a surgeon who served in Vietnam told him that um, as a crisis measure, one's own urine could provide emergency antibiotic properties. Um, you know, it has a little bit lower pH um, than than water, um, but in general, from you know, I've <laughs> the doctors and researchers that I've talked to have said. No, it's not. There's really no particular healthy advantage to our, our saliva. Yes, there are, um, there are proteins in saliva that can help um, with blood clotting. And um, there's some research suggesting maybe some antibacterial properties. And so that's, a, I think, a lot where people get the idea that like dogs have a lot of these antibiotics in their mouth. And so they're particularly good. Mm-hmm. Um, but stu- one, studies were mixed on that. Two, um, probably overwhelmed by the fact that there are also bacteria in your dog's mouth that are very foreign to us and that can mm-hmm. cause severe infections. So I would not risk it on that. Um, with peeing on a wound, I mean, you're probably not going to hurt yourself if you pee on your <laughs> on, okay. on a wound. <laughs> um, there's gen- generally not um, tons of bacteria um, in pee that I'd be worried about someone consuming. But okay. um, as a the idea that it has like magical kind of health benefits, yeah. not really. I, I would think if water. I <laughs> with some waste products in it. <laughs> no. Yeah. I, I would think if I could pee on my own wound, that means um yoga class has been very successful for me. Cause that's <laughs> that's a lot of contorting. Yeah, I mean, depending on where the wound is. Exactly. <laughs> and it's, it's not on my ankle. Down your ankle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, this yeah. is really more of a conversation for men anyway. But <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. And um, I knew about the whole dog licking you not being good thing because my cat told me he said totally yes. false. Holy false. And um, David, I just wanted to address um, something you said and and then tie it into what Eric has just said. Um, He mentioned that two brothers survived almost 200 days trapped under the rubble of the recent it can't be 200 days because that but many days um, Mm -hmm. under the rubble of the of the Turkish earthquake. And I guess what were the options? They weren't trapped with a water or with a vending machine. They ha- they used what they had, and it you know just to get some liquid in the body. I'm assuming is better than none in that situation. That's pretty what, extreme, um, but I mean it, it is extreme. Um, there's actually there's <laughs> you'll you'll see a lot of um, survivalists um, on YouTube things like that who are adamant about this. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people quoted a. Um, like an army field guide or something. I actually looked that up and um, th- what I saw for from the military was that they were advising soldiers not to drink their own urine. Um, mm. you're, you, can sur- you can survive for, for um, a few days at least um, mm-hmm. without, without water. And so again, you know, I haven't done the experiment myself 
to see how yeah. long I can survive on my pee versus, you know, um, it, that's not an easy experiment to do. So I no. think there is some healthy scientific debate there. Um, but from what I have, from the research that I've done, um, drinking your own urine is not a very good survival tactic. Yeah. I mean, I just, I'd just rather have wine. I mean, you know, white <laughs> wine is enough of a step down for me. I'm not gonna, <laughs> Um, let's see, we've got quite a few um, questions and comments here. And, and Neil, yes, of course, as a physician, gross anatomy is part of their daily lives. And they, they use it, you know, they get used to it in their training, which is why I'm not a doctor, everyone, not that type of doctor. Sean asked an interesting question. Um, and you mentioned this early in your talk, are the, are the facial uh, features associated with discussed universal? Pretty much, yeah. People okay. in different cultures make the same face basically when something's disgusting yeah oh wow i've okay. seen pictures of you know um people all over the world <laughs> oh, wow. the same face. i think wow. there was even so a we... picture of hadza you know people um hunter gatherer tribe and they you know, same face <laughs> that that seems wow. to be pretty universal so it is a real feeling um okay. again i think what's cultural tends to be more what we think is disgusting um yes. especially when it comes down to things like food where you know it's really up for grabs like is stinky cheese disgusting or delicious it's you know it's up to you i i i love france i'm learning french i'm going to air on you <laughs> <laughs> that, that's just me you um richard yeager and I, I listen i'm sure there are many people who are in this field that, that i may not know um but mention that uh you seem to like mary roach or you've read a lot of her have you have you met her was she part of your research i have met her she's wonderful she's just as charming in person as she is in her delightful writing she's a wonderful um humor writer as well as a science writer and um Yes, she's definitely one of my inspirations. Um, and when I met her, we commiserated over the fact that we wrote, we both have written about a lot of gross things. And so as a result, we have a lot of people coming up to us and suggesting that we should write a book about farts <laughs> or about a butts. Whole book, you say? Or <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. It, everyone seems to think it's a good idea. <laughs> but I don't know. Maybe a blog post. Can we get a whole book out of that? And next I thing think you know, a it's a podcast. A that's a lot. <laughs> I think that's a lot for a book. Now, I, I am, thank you, um, uh, Megan, for a, uh, ans asking this question. Um, how could we possibly bring up these uh, toxin fallacies uh, with loved ones without making them feel defensive? Any suggestions? Gosh, you know, it's the same thing. It's the same problem that we face with so many myths and things that we're irrational about, right? I mean, it, it can get down to the point of, you know, it's it feels like you're having a conversation with your drunk uncle about politics, you know, it's just not fun. Um, I think that I try to just be, I try to be humorous and present facts and, you know, logic in a humorous way and pointing out to people, you know, funny stories um, and, and thinking, helping them just kind of think it through, like, does it make any sense really? Like what is actually in sweat? Um, and, and just kind of feel free to use me as a scapegoat to <laughs> say, well, I read this writer, <laughs> you know, I read this writer talking about, um, you know, some kind of crazy scientist actually tried to measure how much, you know, of these toxins was in our sweat. And it was a surprise, you know, it was a surprise mm. because it makes sense to think that there's gross stuff in our sweat, but it turned out that it, you know, it really wasn't a very good way of flushing toxins out of our body. That was, you know, wow. so I think sometimes framing things as a surprise, you know, not putting down someone's logic um, is a good way of, of going, you know, because like all of these things, you know, we, our, our logic may be off. <laughs> Um, our instincts may be off, you know, our, our kind of gut feeling about something may be off, but um, that doesn't mean that we're dumb. We, you know, we're all, like I said, we're all subject to the same kinds of um, magical thinking. We? we all feel disgust and we all react to it. 
that leads me to, and we're, we're almost right at the top of the hour, but I wanted to get this in. This was an interesting comment and question um, from Peter uh, Roloff. I hope I'm saying that correctly. And my apologies if I ever mispronounce anyone's name with a name, with a spelling like mine. <laughs> I'm very sensitive to that. Um, but Peter, he said, I've worked in property management and am well aware of the bed bug, roach, and ant infestations. How, uh, however, the disgust reaction is well merited since they constitute a real health danger. Why discourage the reaction to this? But I think that might be a little different from what you're talking about. But can you speak yeah. to that? Yeah, I mean, I think it is perfectly reasonable to be concerned about, um, you know, creatures that could carry. Um, that could legitimately be carrying disease or bacteria. Um, for the most part, um, you know, having like I've got, I've got a problem with a few roaches in my, you know, kitchen sink. Um, for the most part, I don't think it's a health concern. Um, they're not, they're not going to be probably carrying. Uh, I'm not going to have enough of them to for it to be uh, something where they're really going to pass along a disease to me. But I wouldn't say, you know, there's a reason why we feel disgust and, and it's legitimate when we're trying to protect ourselves from illness. Yeah. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. There's, disgust is not a bad emotion or something to be avoided at all costs. Uh, it's just something to be aware of and to think about why you're feeling disgusted by something. If it's, if it's a legitimate fear, it's something that really might make you sick. Absolutely. You know, yeah. be grossed out. <laughs> Yeah. It, what you don't want to do is have my level of imagination and magical thinking where I'm that, okay, are those roaches in the sink going to band together and make a plan and overthrow the human owner of the house? Yeah. It, it, yeah. Right, that's the right. road I go down. Yes, everybody. exactly. I yeah. Have to just rein it in. Yeah. You want to rein it in and, you know, so that you don't end up it, like it can happen to regular people. Let me tell you, there are a lot of people who suffer from delusions of infestation. It's a real thing. Yeah. It's serious. It ruins people's lives. And mm. to try to argue with someone who has, you know, convinced themselves and is desperate to convince others that there is a real infestation of insects in their body. It's horrible. And so again, I think being able to recognize um, where your feelings are coming from and, and head some of that off before <laughs> it goes off the rails um, and seeing it in others and helping, helping them um, not feel crazy because it's not crazy, mm -hmm. um, but to figure out what's really going on um, yeah. and what's really causing the sensations. Um, you know, that's, that's a great thing. And if, if anything that I said can help one person recognize a sign like that in someone else and offer a helping hand, um, I'll feel like I've done my job. And and even just your 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 book in general, I mean, it's it's handled with such um, intelligence and grace and humor that you know, I if somebody like me <laughs> can read it, um, I, I think many of you will enjoy the book. And um, I just got, want to sneak in one more question and thank you for the, you know, the generosity of your time. Um, Tom LaRussa asks, are humans the only species that experience disgust? Perhaps mm. other primates or other species? There are other species that will avoid um, certain things like excrement. Um, <laughs> so I think there's some evidence that there's some root there, but I will say humans have evolved the most complex sense of disgust, um, mm -hmm. even to the point where we have this entire system of manners, which I think serves largely to protect each other from being grossed out. Um, you know, the reason why, you know, we are so careful about not um, burping or <laughs> putting our body fluids around <laughs> things that at least not on the first date save yeah, something exactly. for the second like, date everybody that would be rude <laughs> and so we we you know we're very kind to each other in trying to protect each other from from being disgusted and i think we i think as far as i know we're probably the only species that has a, an elaborate system of manners <laughs> to the extent that we do and, and multi-billion dollar industries, deodorant, everybody. What are we protecting each other from? Exactly. Don't stop doing it. So. <laughs> but I keep wearing it. But, but yes, we are. It's, it's to the point of obsession. <laughs> 
Well, Erica, thank you so much um, for your your uh, your your time and your knowledge and and your book and sharing that that with us tonight. And I just want to remind everybody: if you missed any of this presentation, it has indeed been recorded and will be available tomorrow for you to catch up, rewatch, and share at skepticalinquirer.org. And as always, uh, my thanks to you, Erica, for for being here. Skeptical Inquirer, the Center for Inquiry. Uh, tonight's producer, Mike Powell. As always, we are nothing without you, sir. <laughs> thank you for doing this. And of course, a big thank you uh, to all of you in the audience who made the time to attend. Uh, my name is Leanne Lord. Uh, thank you and good night. Good night, Erica. Thank you. Good night. Thank you so much.